turning to Revelation chapter 9, and today Samuel Hoppe will be reading for us Revelation chapter 9, starting at verse 1. All right, let us start with prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you that we can meet together to read it, to learn about you. I pray that right now as we read and hear your word, that your Holy Spirit would be working in our minds and our hearts, giving us understanding, <clears throat> giving us insight. I pray that we would, we would learn from this and that it would shape our lives. Okay, so this is Revelation chapter 9 uh, from the NIV, <clears throat> starting at verse 1. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen to the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came down from the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not given power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days, men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will be them. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails, they had power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, which, according to the footnote, both of those names mean destroyer. The first woe is past. Two other woes are yet to come. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet, and I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel, who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels, who had been kept ready for this very hour, and day, and month, and year, were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. They, the heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plates of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes, having heads with which they could inflict injury. The rest of mankind that were not killed by these three plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see, hear, or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their theft. sermon series is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ, and it is a chapter-by-chapter -chapter study of this book of Revelation. Last week, we read about Jesus opening the seventh seal of a scroll, 
And when he opened that seventh seal, he revealed a torrent of judgments from God that came upon the earth. And these judgments are part of what the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. We read about this last week. We noted that the seventh seal, the seventh one that was opened, contained within it seven plagues. That is, when the seventh seal was opened, seven additional plagues now came forth. Each one of them resembled in some ways some of the plagues of ancient Egypt, only much worse and much more widespread worldwide. Each plague was announced by the trumpet call of an angel. We can visualize it all this way. As each of these trumpet calls come forth, they are all part of this final seal that was opened. And so here we see on the screen, on the left column, which is difficult to see, but if you look very closely, you can imagine it, I guess, there are seven red seals. And the last of them, the bottom one of them, once opened, reveals these seven trumpets that come forth. In the first trumpet call, there was fire and hail. The second one, the sea became as blood. The third, fresh water became bitter. The fourth, sunlight, another light was struck, and that was not any longer the same strength that it once was. And now, we are ready for the remaining three trumpets, but they were going to get still worse than the ones we've heard about yet. There was, at the very end of the last chapter, a voice that proclaimed, Whoa! 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 Woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the three other angels. The remaining three of these plagues are going to be worse than what we have seen yet. We begin here at chapter 9 of verse 1 where we hear about something out of the abyss. It says, The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and, John says, I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, we'll pause there, John sees in his vision a star falling, but this is not apparently a, an inanimate object. Instead, what we see here is that this star is called He, and the star is able to do things. This is a bright but fallen star, likely a fallen angel, or maybe we should say the fallen angel. And God gives permission for this fallen one to bring suffering on the earth, even the way that God had once done. Listen, back in the book of Job, God said at one time to Satan, you may bring this kind of suffering to Job and his family up to these limits. And in this case, there is suffering that is going to be permitted from this evil one up to certain limits. But this suffering will not affect just one family or a few people. It will impact the whole world. The star, as we read, opens the abyss. He takes the key to the shaft of the abyss and he opens it. What is this word abyss? The word is simply one which means, I don't know if I have it, I guess I don't have this. The word is simply one that says that it is very deep or bottomless very deep or a bottomless thing. It is the great deep of the earth. It is the place where some demons are imprisoned. You say demons being imprisoned somewhere? I don't want to know about this. The Bible mentions in a number of key places that there are demons which roam this earth and do destructive things, but that there are some who are held in a kind of a captivity for a long time in a very deep place called the abyss. And one of the places we run into this kind of teaching is a time when Jesus met a man who was demon-possessed by a legion of demons. And Jesus said to this demon-possessed man, you know, what is your name? And the man said, the name is Legion, because they have all the demons in me. And Jesus said, I'm going to cast you all out. And the demons fled with Jesus. And they said, don't send us into the abyss. We don't want to be there. We won't be able to do what we prefer. Don't send us there. In the end, they ended up being cast into a herd of pigs. The text says they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. That coming from Luke 8.31. Countless demons today are sealed in this, this abyss, but at the fifth trumpet judgment, they will be revealed. On unlocking the abyss, the Bible says that smoke begins to billow up out of this. We can read about it here in chapter 9. 
When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth, and were given power like that of scorpions on the earth. The sky, the sun is darkened. Something like a locust swarm pours out, darkens the sky. This reminds us of one of the plagues of Egypt, namely a plague of locusts. Just to review, if we were reading back in Exodus, one of the plagues that was poured out on the people in that day, the Egyptians who were rejecting God, it said, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over Egypt so that locusts will swarm over the land and devour everything growing in the fields, everything left out by the hail. So Moses stretched out his staff over Egypt, and the Lord made an east wind blow across the land all that day, all that night. By morning, the wind had brought the locusts. They invaded all Egypt settled down in every area of the country in great numbers. Never before had there been such a plague of locusts, nor will there ever be again. They covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left after the hail, everything growing in the fields and the fruit on the trees. Nothing green remained on tree or plant in all the land of Egypt. Our plague here directly was, well, it refers to that plague of ancient Egypt, that plague in Egypt is a foreshadowing of this plague. But the two plagues are not identical. This one is different and much worse. These locusts are no mere insects. And we know this in part because they don't touch the plants. They don't eat the grass, they don't eat the trees, they don't eat the vegetables, they don't eat any of this. Instead they go after the they seem apparently larger than regular locusts. One reason I think that is because in a little bit we're going to get a full description of what their faces were like and what they wore. You know, little insects don't typically have, you know, things they're wearing and faces and so on. It appears they're somewhat larger. They're going after people to harm them. There is a swarm of them coming from the abyss. They don't come from what you and I would think of as a biological source, but from a demonic sort of source. The work of these demon locusts, well, we can describe this work as we start here in verse 4. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not given the power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days, Men will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. Checking off the things about these demon locusts, their power was like that of scorpions, verse 3. Painful, debilitating stings. They did not harm the plant life, verse 4. Not the grass, not the plants, not the trees. They did not harm those who didn't have the seal of God. You will recall as an example that there were a couple chapters ago, some 144,000 that God said, I'm going to mark these off, they belong to me. And one such as they were not in any way harmed by these demons. They were not permitted to kill those that they came after. They came and they attacked unbelievers, those who were not sealed by God, but they did not kill them. They were not permitted to. They did, however, verse 5, inflict torture for five months with the agony that was like scorpion stings. I've never been stung by a scorpion, and I understand that there are all varying kinds of scorpions, some of them more deadly than others, but to have such a sting, especially for ones that are very deadly or very, well, painful, to be something that would be debilitating and awful for a long period of time, and to have that happen maybe repeatedly, got to the point where it says in verse 6, men would prefer immediate death over the pain that they were suffering. They would long to die, but they cannot. In so many ways, this is a taste of hell. Torment from demons without the opportunity to be released by anything, including death. It goes on and on and on. This is not simply human evil. It is direct demonic evil, and there are going to be people who will suffer this during these days of tribulation. Now let me point something out again in case you missed this. Listen. These are Satan's forces. These are demons who are torturing people who rejected God. People who might have said, well, I don't want any of that God stuff. I want to just do it my way. 
Some might even say, I don't want any of that God stuff. I like what Satan has to offer. I'll take what he has. And now these demons have come, and they are torturing the supporters of Satan. And this brings up a very important part, a very important point, I should say. Satan desires to bring people to himself by any means. To say that Come on, you don't have to do it God's way. Do it this way. You like it better. Come on, do it my way. We have a lot more fun this way. And then, on drawing them into that web, he seeks to destroy them. That will bring us to the first of our revelations for today. God loves you. You can trust him. Satan hates you and wants to destroy you. Satan offers pleasures and temptations now, but his goal is to torture and destroy. Let's all listen to this for just a moment. I have known of many people who say, why do it God's way? I'll do it my way. And years later you check back with them, and what has resulted has been destruction. I've known of some people who have overtly said, I want to do what I think Satan wants me to do. I think that sounds appealing. And then still later, sometimes soon after and sometimes long after, what results is great destruction in their lives. This is how Satan treats his friends. You do not want to be such a friend of Satan or to do the things that Satan would wish for you to do. Instead, it is imperative for us to say, I don't want to be linked to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because again and again, when I look at the Bible, thinking, for example, of that man who was demon possessed in Jesus' day, the one that we referred to just earlier, he had Satan gaining control of his life. And do you remember what he spent his days doing? Cutting himself open, living off in a cave somewhere in torment, apart from other people. It is Satan's desire to divide people from what is good and to bring destruction to themselves. And here we see this again. Those who rejected God and would have embraced Satan in some respect now find themselves under such torture. We come to the second part of our message, starting at verse 7. And here we have the description of these demons in a deeper way. We see that they're winged, they fly, they move in vast numbers like locusts, but they hardly look like insects in some way. Let's pick this up at verse 7 and see what it says. The locusts look like Horses prepared for battle. On their heads they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, their teeth were like lion's teeth, they had breastplates as armor, like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. Walking through all of that, it says in some ways they looked like horses in that they were strong and muscular and fast, something like war horses. On their heads they had something like crowns of gold, showing that they were victors or rulers or immediately able to uh, bring conquest. Their faces resembled human faces. No, these are not machines. Nor do they seem to be like instinctive animals or insects of some sort. You'd look at the face and there was intelligence and strategy, evil planning behind every move. Their hair was like women's hair, long and impressive. Their teeth were like lion's teeth, vicious and crushing. But their chief weapon wasn't their teeth. It was, as we see, in their tails. They had these breastplates of iron, apparently not easily destroyed by man's usual weapons. Whatever was going on in this overall conquest of people, whatever was being shot at them, as I imagine people might do, was deflecting properly. The sound of their wings was like the thunder of many horses and chariots, the loud clattering of wings, it was frightening. They had tails with stings like scorpions, inflicting terrible pain, like venom from a stinger. And they had the power to torment people for five months. God gave them free run of the earth for five months. They could not touch those sealed by God, but they sought harm all that they could. Now, I have had some folks who have said, well, maybe this is a primitive description of something where Daniel was seeing the future and he was seeing 
helicopters or other weapons, and that this is just what that may be. And I can say, well, maybe. Obviously, God knows, but it seems unlikely. Firstly, they came from the abyss, the prison of demons, which is not typical of helicopters. Next, they're bringing terrible suffering, but not death. It's an interesting deal. This weapon from Satan is not bringing death the way that you would typically think of as the kind of powerful weapons we have, but it is bringing only suffering. They have faces and hair, and they're not under any human direction. Instead, they're under the power of a demon that we're going to meet next here as we look at verse 11. They had his king over them, the angel of the abyss, that is, and you know that he uh, demons are fallen angels. They had this angel of the abyss whose name is in Hebrew, Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, same name. Here's a picture, I guess, of some of these ones coming out of the abyss. That same name means, in both languages, destroyer. Apollyon is a ranking demon who leads Satan's forces to bring as much harm to people that God has created as possible. He brings as much harm as possible, and he leads them in all of this. All of this brings up a couple questions that people might ask. The first question someone may ask is, Pastor, are demons real? There have been seasons where some people have said, well, we're scientific and sophisticated now, and we don't know if we want to believe in demons. Are demons real? And the answer to that is, yes, they are real. The Bible tells us that we should not be unaware of them. I'm thinking of what it says in Ephesians 6.12. It says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, meaning that the greatest enemy we have isn't any person. And this is written at a time where there were evil rulers who were trying to kill Christians. And you might say, well, now there's the enemy. It's this evil ruler. And instead, the Bible says, our real enemy isn't any person. It's not any flesh and blood. It's something that is a spiritual enemy. Against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The Bible says that in the spiritual world, there are forces of evil that we should not be unaware of. But we should, in fact, know that we need to be armed and protected against such attacks. Is everyone with me on this so far? Are demons real? The answer is yes. Do demons have bodies such that we can see them? The answer is Generally, no, we don't see them any more than we see angels, who we are also told, surround us. There are angels that are involved in God's governance of this world and who are around in ways that we generally do not see. In the scriptures, are there times when someone sees an angel? Yes. Since then, have there have been occasions when people have seen angels? Yes. But generally speaking, you're not likely day to day to be seeing an angel if they're there. Likewise with demons. Are there times that Satan and his demons have been seen? Satan took on the form of a serpent early on in creation and showed himself in a bodily form. Here we have demons who are taking on the bodily form and they were seen. Generally speaking, we do not see them, but frequently, frequently people do sense them and feel their evil presence. And occasionally people who you know as responsible people who don't otherwise make things up. Occasionally one of them will say, I was having this experience and then something demonic appeared to me. That can and does happen. What is your best defense under such circumstances? Your best defense, of course, is to belong to Jesus Christ and to call on him because while demons have more power than you do, Jesus has more power than they do. To call on Jesus Christ for his protection and specifically, I think this is somewhat key, to specifically mention Jesus' blood shed for us. To say, Jesus, I call on you to protect me by your blood. has an effect. And the Bible says that it is right for us to understand how to arm ourselves against Satan's attack, because Satan is real. A revelation for today. Demons are evil angels that exist in great numbers. A little more history. The Bible tells us that Satan himself and his demons were once angels, created beings, who rebelled against God, 
and took on an evil character, and they are still existing, and they still impose God in his work. They are evil angels existing in great numbers. We should not be unaware of their presence, nor should we be deceived about their destructive intentions. They are destroyers. But I have one more word to add to this. Jesus is our fortress. Praise God for that. So that was the fifth trumpet. The first of these three woes that we were told were coming. And that was a great woe. Whereas previously there had been destruction of the environment and other sort of terrible things. In this case now there is torturous things happening for mankind over a period of five months. What comes next? It is really a plague of death. And it starts here at verse 13. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet. And I heard a voice coming from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. It said to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The sixth angel sounded his trumpet. The next plague begins. We hear a voice in heaven speaks. It comes from the throne room of God. And this voice of authority instructs the angel who just sounded the trumpet, saying, I want you to do this. Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. These four angels, I'm going to let you in on something here. These four angels are not godly angels. One way we know this is there's no reason to bind up and chain godly angels who always obey the Lord. These are ones who are chained someplace, and they remind us a little bit of these ones that were in the abyss that were being kept squelched for a long time until God says, let them loose. And now we've got four specific angels that have been bound for a long time, and they're bound at the river Euphrates, which is a place, Middle Eastern, generally speaking, Mesopotamia, Mary, the place by and large where creation began, people fell into sin, people deserted God, there was a flood, all the things happened that originated in that part of the world, apparently, and listen, I don't know this, and this is a subjective, sort of a, a subjective thing that uh, maybe just my own surmise, but if there were angels that were on hand, demons, who were a part of that original rebellion, that original falling away, that original sort of a separation of man from God, for them to be held there in a place in a manner that they would do no more harm for a time until God said, let them loose. It's been all these years since the original rebellion, now we want to let them loose. This is apparently what is going on. These four angels are being set loose, released. And it's God's timing. I want you to understand this. They weren't loosed by their own timing or in some accidental way. The Bible says this was the year, this was the month, this was the day, this was the hour. It was done at God's direction right now. And so these four angels are being cut loose. What did they do? They went forth, it says, to kill a third of mankind. There have been many people who in this time of tribulation likely have died, but they did not die during that season where they were being tortured. And now, if we have a third of mankind, you could imagine that this could range into the billions of people. And for billions of people to die all at once, I mean, previously, they wanted to die and could not, and now they can hardly keep from dying. All of this mass death and all of the horror that would go along with it, I can only imagine what it would be to try to say, how will we take care of the burial of millions of people at once? How will society keep functioning in any way at all in terms of hygiene, or people fulfilling different jobs, and there would be a collapse of society like you can't imagine if we have a third of all people being wiped out of this manner at once. What does this correspond to in terms of the plagues of Egypt? In my understanding, the last of the plagues, the one that finally shook Pharaoh, at least temporarily, was one where there was a death angel and God had said, these ones are going to die. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And there was a limit to that. Similarly here, angels are released and they go forth and the limit that God gives them is one-third. 
they would have the power to do 100% if they wanted to, if they could. The God says one third, this is what you're going to do. And so here we have a picture just referencing the death angel who went through Egypt. When there was that time that God said there will be widespread death, there will be weeping and howling in every house all throughout Egypt. It will not affect those who are my servants, but all through Egypt, this is what will take place. And that was the last of the great plagues in Egypt. What happens in this case? The Bible talks to us about this, starting in verse 15, the four angels who had been kept ready for this hour, day, month, and year, were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. What are we talking about here? These four angels aren't doing this alone. They have some 200 million in their armies. Are these armies human armies? And the answer is maybe. It's not impossible that there could be some 200 million that would come together to do the work of these angels. However, the description of their armies sounds an awful lot like demons. We're going to get into their description in just a moment. And it seems that there were some 200 million who are joining in with this work in bringing such death and destruction. Let's find out a little more about these ones. The horses and riders I saw in my vision, these armies, were 17. Looked like this. Their breastplates, that is their armor, fiery red, dark blue, and yellow is somber, colorful. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. These demonic creatures, if they are that, are breathing out fiery things, sulfurous stuff. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The power of the horses was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails were like snakes having heads with which they inflict injury. So both from the fiery things from their mouths and from the terrible things coming from their tails, these demonic-like creatures had something that was terrorizing and killing people. A couple of pictures, and these are grim. And I guess are intentionally so because they are meant to reflect something of what the artist would see of Satan's demons in their intentions. Something horse-like, something terrible, both in the mouth and in the tail. A different picture here with something a little like that and several of them together. Fire coming from the mouth. This army is in some ways similar to the stinging army of the previous plague. But those things have been simply a painful torture. This new army is inflicting not only injury, but mass death. And that brings us to the fourth part of our message about the people who won't repent, starting at verse 20. The rest of mankind that were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons. And idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. I want you to notice something, and we pointed this out last week. There is an escalation going on. The plagues start, and they're awful. And then they get worse, and then they get worse, and then they get worse, and they keep getting worse. And God does this, as we noted in order to get people's attention. I want your attention. Will you repent and turn to me? Stronger plagues, first with harms to the planet, and then horrors of all kinds, suffering people, and finally death to people with more and more yet demonic violence. So many dead, so many mass graves, such complete civil breakdown, breakdown such worldwide terror. How do the remaining people respond? They've noted in a previous chapter, they've said, this is obviously the work of God in some way. They've seen it. How do they respond? Well, the Bible says the following, Revelation 9.20, the rest of mankind that weren't killed still did not repent. They still did not repent. God sends correction, he sends judgment so the people will repent. It's discipline. He gives them the chance to recognize their sin and to turn to God. 
but their hearts are more like Pharaoh. You remember at that final plague, where the death angel came through and there was so much death, finally Pharaoh said, all right, all right, all right, I give. You, you can go, he says. And then hours later he says, I didn't mean that. And he turns back again to opposing God. You remember this? The Bible says that the people of this generation, the ones who face this tribulation, will by and large, there may be individual exceptions, I don't know, by and large, for the great majority, perhaps for all, they will say, we've already come this far down into this punishment, this far down into this plague, this far down into our rebellion against God, we're not going to repent now. And they did not repent, even with this plague of death that came on. It tells us what they did not repent of. They did not stop worshiping demons. They did not stop worshiping idols. They did not repent of murder. They did not repent of evil magic. They didn't repent of sexual immorality. They didn't repent of theft. Friends, I want to talk to you about this for a moment. I don't know when this time of tribulation may arrive, but I can tell you that the human heart is wicked, and that even in our own generation, we have far more of these sins that these people refuse to repent of than we once did. Handling them in reverse order, starting with theft. I can remember a time when you could go into a store and there were no security systems there to keep people from stealing things. Don't you? I lived in a place where you could drive up and pump gas and then write down a sheet of paper how much you had done and then settle up later. Now, I go places and there are bulletproof shields between me and the bank teller. And there's pay before you pump. It was never paid before you pump. Why? Theft has become commonplace. It's assumed that people are going to walk out with things and we need to put metal detectors at every exit. You all understand this. We live in a generation where theft has become commonplace. The Bible says that the people who have turned their lives over to Satan will not repent of such things. Sexual immorality. I suppose there has always been sexual immorality of one kind or another. But today, I live in a generation where it doesn't just exist, but it is celebrated. It is celebrated. It is made to be entertainment. It is made to be a special right. It is made to be something that we all ought to really think is progress because of immorality. The people who came into this time of tribulation did not repent of their sexual life. Magic powers. Today, there are organized groups of people who practice witchcraft. Whereas that one of you know, the one time being hidden, if it was happening at all. Today, it is not hidden. People today will tell you, this is the kind of witchcraft I practice, and this is the group that I do that. The Bible says people in that generation will not repent of such magic powers. Murder. I suppose we've always had murder to one degree or another, but it is in my lifetime that we have legalized widespread murder in the form of abortion and other such things. And we have said this is normal. The Bible says that people did not repent. Idols. There are numerous kinds of idols. But at least at one time we'd say we shouldn't exalt or idolize something so much that God needs to be first. Today, if somebody stepped forward in government and said, we need to put God first, there would be howls of protest. Is that true? Yeah. Instead, we are to say we need to really put it the highest government or education, or at least the economy, or perhaps certain people who we think are really tremendous. We might even make a television show and say we're going to try to find a new idol. That kind of language wouldn't have existed in that way some decades ago, but it seems normal just now. 
the Bible says they wouldn't turn away from those idols or the king of death. Worshipping demons. I don't admit that of that whole list, that's the one thing that I see less the people at least admitting or saying that that's what they want to do is worship demons. I've known some. I've known a number of people who come to me and said, I have given my life to the serving or worshiping a certain demon whom I know is there. That's still uncommon. By the time we get to this time of tribulation, there will be many who will, maybe many or most, who will say, I have seen demons with my own eyes. They've been revealed, and I align myself with them. I worship them. I try to have some way where I am in with these demons. And even when those demons begin to torment them and kill them, they will hold to their worship of demons and not repent. If there are six items here in this list, we're already at least five, six of the way there as far as I can see. By the time God brings more and more discipline, more and more plagues upon the people saying, Stop! Repent! Turn to me! By that time, it will seem to be to them too late. And they will not stop and turn. Even when the demons turn on. Even when they are killed by Satan. All of this seems to me to be like the first taste of hell. Those who were being tortured and could not die, and worship demons and couldn't stop themselves, and are being killed in a widespread way, and don't turn to God and feel they can't turn to God. The whole thing becomes a taste of hell. And I would say as a result, this is warning given to us, written in God's word. Listen now. Warning written in God's word that says, now, while you still have the spiritual sense to do it, repent and turn your life to Christ. There will come a time later. You will say, well, I'll put that off till later, another time. And the Bible would say, at that time later, the people don't turn themselves back to the Lord. They feel perhaps too far gone, and they don't maybe feel they can't. If the Lord himself is speaking to your heart today and saying, come, be mine, be on my side. You do not want to serve him. Now is the time to respond to him. Does everyone understand this? It's fairly simple. While you still have the spiritual clarity to do so, repent and turn to Christ now. Because it will not get easier later, it will get harder later even as the judgments from God begin to pile up. Our revelation for today, the time to repent is now. It will be harder later, and most people will find themselves unable to do so. The time to give your life to Jesus Christ is now. You do not want to be under the power of demons, either during the tribulation or in hell. These things are real. And the time to turn to the Lord is now while you understand these things. How would you do that? You put it very simply. Jesus Christ said that your sins, though they are many, He does forgive because He took the burden of all of that sin onto Himself at the cross. He says He took the burden of all of that and suffered the punishment. And that his forgiveness can be applied to the lives of each one who will believe on him and trust in him. If you say, I reject that, I don't want to believe on him and trust him in this way, then there is no such forgiveness for sin. If you say, I will receive this, and Jesus has done this, and I give my life to him, I trust in him, and he is mine, and he will lead my life going forward now, there is such forgiveness for sin. And there is protection from the things that Satan intends. Some things that Satan intends in this life, and more importantly, the things that Satan intends for bringing destruction to people forever. During our closing minutes of this service, it is possible for you today to say, I will put my faith in Jesus Christ. There is a decision to be made like that. It's one that says, I believe this, I receive this, and I will belong to Christ. I believe that's part of why we're told all these things ahead of time. We say that 
God is in control, he knows what he's doing. He will bring judgment. He is one. He is calling people to himself so that Jesus will be lifted up in our lives. And it's my dear hope that that would be your response to what we're discussing here today. Next week, we come to chapter 10, and then 11 and 12 and following weeks. And I will warn you, it doesn't get better, but in some ways spiritually worse as we go along in this for those who are rejecting Christ. The time to receive Christ is now. Let's end with prayer. Mm -hmm. Our Lord, we pray that we would be aware in the right way of what is spiritually true that goes on around us. So many of our own experiences, thoughts, and emotions, and so on, are prompted by something that is beyond us. Even great events in this world are so often prompted not by men, but by demonic forces who have their allegiance. Satan. And yet, Jesus, we declare that you are most powerful and we trust in you. I pray particularly for the ones who do not know Jesus the same. Even for the ones who Satan would whisper in their ear and say, How can this be true? Why don't you put off this for another time because this seems so inconclusive? And Satan would say that to me someone here, and I pray, Lord, that you would give clarity and understanding. And that there would be faith that would arise as a gift for you. Trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. I pray that today would be a day of salvation for some who are here. And so we pray for this. We ask you Together we consciously choose to worship Jesus our Savior, the one who can save from sin and from Satan, from death and from hell. We declare ourselves to be for Jesus today, and we pray this in Jesus' name.